Robin Lundberg Show with you. Back in a new week. Fresh start. A new week for all of us, guys. A new new beginnings. Except for, for P. Diddy. Um, no way out for Diddy at this moment, it seems like. Lots of stuff happening right before I, I went on the air. Um, obviously, the, there's this Diddy news. I'll, I'll give you a, a few thoughts on that. I, I really don't have that much to say or add. Then there's Shohei Otani's press conference, immediately followed by what looks like a, a sports gambling controversy in the NBA. You know, I sort of covered this on my last show. Uh, I'll get into why I don't know if the sports gambling being legalized actually makes this worse or not, but that'll come in, in just a bit. I really want to talk about Kendrick and Drake because I have been spinning like that on repeat over and over and over again all weekend long. Probably ran that joint back a hundred times. I'm amped and excited um, about what this feud could be and, and just that record in general and, and Kendrick's verse. But I'm probably the only person, or I guess I'm, I'm essentially the only person on the planet who can talk about this particular topic I'm about to talk about um, with authority uh, with, and with firsthand experience. Um, I don't know if you, you all saw this, but there was a clip from a Conor McGregor interview I did for SI that went like super viral over the weekend. Um, it was really, it was ripped by a Twitter user and that, you know, tweet has 23 million views or whatever it is. Um, I, I saw it elsewhere online. I think DJ Academics put it on his TikTok. The YouTube video itself from the, the SI YouTube page is exploding. And there, there's comments on comments on comments on comments. So um, I've had people come up to me and ask me, you know, what happened or or say, hey, we saw this. And, and I want to make this very clear. I'm not trying to get clout off of something like this. Um, that's why I wasn't really promoting it over the course of the weekend or, or really like, you know, doing a victory lap that it, that it went so viral. I didn't do anything. I was just there. You know, there's plenty of other interviews where I feel like my line of questioning or my follow-up has elicited a great soundbite or a great, great quote. Um, in this case, um, you know, I, I was just uh, in the frame, more or less. Um, and I think I was the only person who talked to Conor McGregor on that particular day. But if you haven't seen it, here's the clip that got so blown up. It was taken from an account called Casual MMA. They wrote, Conor McGregor is literally involuntarily spasming from drugs in his latest interview with Sports Illustrated. I did not write that. Just to be clear, those are not my words. Um, but that is the clip that, that really, really blew up and, and drew people to the full interview. In case you hadn't seen it, here it is. Jake's a consummate professional, 75 movies made. You know, I was, I'm blessed to have entered into the movie alongside him. He was patient with me. He gave me guidance and I just took it. You know, we had a good rapport on set. He has 75 movies made. I have 75 bar fights made. And that's it. We had a good back. And I sometimes had to remind him. <laughs> I, la I landed one punch. Once. And, and he hit me with a door. <laughs> Other than that, it was absolutely perfect. That's had, true. An amazing stunt, a stunt team, Garrett Warden and Steve Brown. And they were phenomenal with us. They gave us free reign. And we've done a good job. Is that hard for you, Connor, at all? Because you've been in so many real fights to, to realize, yeah, I'm trying to make this look real, but, you know, I am acting. For me, what was hard was it was time consuming. 18 hours on set. Very little rest. It was strange to me, but, you know, the fight scenes, I was happy to give my input and my oar. And Jake, as I said, is a consummate professional. We've done a good job. You check it out for yourself. Roadhouse 2024, Amazon Prime Video. Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor. Appreciate it. All right. So I did not see that clip until it really went viral. Um, if I'm being real with you, I, I did not see. So let me set the, the context for you for a second. This was Monday that that was shot on um, Monday, the day after St. Patrick's Day. And I had been expecting 
to talk to Jake Gyllenhaal only. This was a, a pre-booked thing through a press junket. I ex- expected to, to talk to Jake Gyllenhaal only. And this was also the morning that we at SI found out the Minute Media news. The, that um, Minute Media had acquired the license to operate Sports Illustrated. And we're still figuring out exactly what that means. So obviously, an eventful morning. And I'm expecting to talk to, to Jake Gyllenhaal. And instead, at first, I talked to two of the co-stars from the movie who I was not prepared to speak to. Um, and I was thrown into a room with them. And I did a quick interview with them off the cuff. Then I was told, oh, it's going to be Jake and Connor. And I was like, okay. Uh, and then I was told, no, it's just going to be Jake. 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 Like said almost frenetically. Uh, and then I hop into the room. And sure enough, it's Jake and Connor sitting there. And I'll be honest with you. I didn't, everybody pointed to the involuntary movements. I did not notice that um, doing the interview live. One, I, I was not prepared to talk to Connor. So, you know, I'm thinking in my head, what am I, what am I asking here? You know, how am I facilitating this between the two of them? Um, obviously, like I said, there was a lot going on. And I was looking at a monitor across from a desk. Um, that didn't have an ISO feed of him, right? Like, so I, I, I didn't see a big picture in a sense. And I, you know, I, I knew he wasn't necessarily all there. And when it, when it finished, that was the first thing I said to somebody at work was Connor was a little out of it. And I believe the editor tried to make him look better. And, and in fact, I think the first answer was cut uh, in order to make him look better. Now, I guess I wasn't that surprised that, you know, you might get some sort of erratic behavior from Connor or, or something, you know, out of the ordinary, I I guess, just from his past history, you know, nothing to do with this movie or this tour or, or, or this interview, you know, just because we, we've seen a lot of stories around Connor and you'd seen stories around him in the press leading up to this movie, some of these other clips of people wondering what's going on with him. You know, he's too fired up in this one interview. And, and then you got the Miami heat mascot thing and the old man, the bar thing, and just a lot of where he's entered a zone of unpredictability, unpredictability. So again, with everything going on at work, you know, by the time this interview gets out there and blows up, we at SI had all been shut out of our operating systems. We're not even, you know, you can read about this. Uh, Front Office Sports did a good expose about it. I'm only going to say stuff that's already out in the public because I'm not trying to get myself in trouble. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll eventually talk about all this when the, the dust is settled. But that's when the interview went, you know, bananas viral in the midst of this transition of the company. Um, so, I had seen the back and forth emails. There were like some back and forth emails where the studio had been asking when this would be done. So they were asking for it. It wasn't like this was being pushed out, like, hurry, guys, let's capitalize on this. In fact, you know, it it was a little while later. And as you can see, like, this was not promoted in a sense to get clicks or to, to make anybody famous or to, you know, get clout, you know, None of that was edited and chopped up. That was all ripped from the full interview, which you can see on YouTube, by the way. Just go to SI's YouTube page if you want to watch the full interview. Um, but, I mean, that's about it. There's not that much more to it as far as, as you know, I'm not going to speculate exactly what's going on, what could be going on with Connor or not. I mean, I think it's pretty easy for people to speculate what it could be. I mean, Look, you know, drugs are bad, okay? That includes alcohol. Um, you know, all those things could be a factor in something like that. And and I did a show, you know, about mental health and alcohol on this very channel. And and I just hope anybody who's struggling gets better. I, I don't know Connor's specific situation, but I I do hope he gets better. Um, if if he's not in a good spot, um, because you know things can get out of control quickly. I will say this. He was incredibly cordial. You know, he sat down. I said, what's up, Connor? He's like, what's up, bro? Or whatever he said. Like, there was nothing. There was nothing behaviorally 
that was out of the ordinary other than, you know, his um, speech patterns were a little off. He seemed a little off physically. And then after the fact, I saw what was dubbed the involuntary spasms and the like. So that's, you know, that's the long and short of it. I, this is not, you know, that might be, I had viral things that I've created, you know, plenty of viral things that I've created that I'm very proud of. This went super viral. I'm not proud to be a part of that. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, think I did anything great or grand to be a part of that. Um, it's not some sort of career accomplishment. Again, it's not even something that I'm editing up and throwing out there and like, check it out. I did this because I didn't do anything. Uh, I just happened to be there. And I think after that, like, again, I, I did not know it was going to be Jake and Connor. I thought it was just going to be Jake. Then they said Jake and Connor. And then they said just Jake. And then it was both of them. And I don't think he did another interview that day. Probably because of what you guys saw in that clip. But like I said, I just hope that Conor McGregor's okay. Um, I just hope if he has, you know, things he's struggling with, that he conquers them. Um, but yeah, I, I did come out of the interview and say something was off with Conor. A little bit. I did say that uh, to my coworkers. And then, like I said, <laughs> crazy, crazy week in the world of Sports Illustrated. That, that was the, the Monday we found out about Minute Media. And then um, it was, you know, we're wondering what's happening that day. And then as this interview was released, uh, we couldn't publish to SI anymore or do the work through SI at the, the current company, Arena Group, anymore. So um, it, was, it was a weird time for this thing to blow up and, and, and the release and, and all that. And, and I wasn't in the normal, like... Um, Level of, uh, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? I wasn't following it every step of the process, if you will. Um, and I didn't see it until it came out. And, and I saw that going crazy on the timeline and I had people contacting me and, and everything like that. But, you know, look, I, I've said before, alcohol is the most dangerous drug in the world. So I, I think people underestimate what that can do to you. Um, people go through alcohol withdrawal. People die from drinking. 5% of all working age males die from drinking related things. Obviously, Rick James can do the cocaine is a hell of a drug bit for you. Obviously, we've seen what pain pills and the like can do. Then there's also not sleeping. What that can do, uh, you know, not sleeping can take a toll on your body. Dehydration can take a toll on your body. Being a professional fighter can take a toll on your body. I'm just throwing out a lot of things because I don't know exactly what's going on with the guy. And aside from the interview that I did, um, I don't think you know you needed that interview to see an erratic pattern of behavior that could be called concerning, for sure. The movie seems to be you know creating some waves. People will talk about it. People talked about that movie a bunch. And, and obviously, Connor was, you know, a charismatic dude. I would be concerned about him getting back in the octagon if that's actually the plan. You know, as the, the sports betting controversies ramped up today, uh, if I were, you know, if Connor McGregor is going to take another fight, I would be betting on his opponent, I guess is what I would say. Josh B. The Press says, Robin, what's up? Kev Du Taylor says it was a good movie. That in reference to Roadhouse. Kevin Zwicker, what was going through your mind when Connor was doing that? Again, I didn't I didn't see the I was too far away without the ISO shot. And and I was trying to adjust to in the moment of interviewing somebody I didn't know I was going to be interviewing, in addition to interviewing Jake. So I didn't um I didn't see the 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 body movements to the degree that I saw. I heard the speech and I thought. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, a little bit. And like I said, I think um, if memory serves me correct, the first answer was chopped to try to make him look better, uh, in fact. Um, but yeah, that was what, that was going through my mind a little bit. Like, what's up with him? But again, it's not like, um, 
I guess it's not surprising to me. It wasn't because I think you got to be prepared for anything. And he was very nice. You know, there was nothing. He, he was very nice. I could understand what he was saying. He clearly knew what he was saying. Um, There was just something off about the delivery. So I wasn't, it wasn't like, again, something else was going on in, on the side too. So it wasn't this like glaring, like alarm bell at the time. Um. And these things are, you know, they throw the, you in this room and you've got a certain amount of time and then, you know, you're on to the next thing. And I was on to the next thing at that point, not really thinking about it. And I, like I said, I made a note of it. I made a note of it when I came out. He he seemed a little out of it. But that's a story. It's not, um, you know, glamorous or anything like that. But I, I figured it was worth addressing on here because of how much noise it's made and because I'm the only person really in the world who could talk about it like that because I'm the one who was in the room for that. Wu says, how come you don't talk about the Knicks as much when they are good? Um, well, one, I used to cover the Knicks and I used to do New York sports talk radio. So I talked about the Knicks more as a result of that. Obviously, in recent times, being more of a Nets fan. I've talked and focused more on the Nets than the, the Knicks. Um, but I, you know, the Knicks are good. And I, and I've said that it's not like I've shied away from, in fact, when you look at the Nets current situation and I, you know, forgetting the Mikhail Bridges report today, again, we, we've seen that stuff surface before that, uh, Bridges was, um, not traded for he could have been traded for a package of of Jalen Green and uh some first round picks and a lot of Nets fans are upset that that didn't happen and that you know that that trade didn't go down and and whatnot and that the Nets made a big mistake by not going through with that trade but what stood out to me more was the report I think it was from Nets Daily over the weekend that said uh, the Nets' plan is to go chase stars because they think they can land a star. And to me, that sounds like an old Knicks plan, right? The Nets now sound like what the Knicks used to be. Um, and the Knicks are a well-run franchise. I think the Knicks need to get healthy. You know, they need Julius Randle out on the floor. They need OG Ananobi out on the floor. But... Leon Rose and company deserve credit. They, they've they done a really nice job. Um, so, you know, being that I'm not covering the Knicks specifically, I don't have as much reason to talk about them. And being that, you know, I've become known for rooting for the Nets or being a Nets person, whatever that is, I talk more about the Nets. Um, but I, does that explanation suffice? I don't know, you know, if anybody else wants to hear more from me on that, but that's, that's what I got for you. That's my explanation on that. Make sure you guys like subscribe to the channel and all that. I finally got the um, poster for the, the KD tweet that I said I was going to hang on my wall. I'm just waiting for Staples to email me and tell me that it's ready so I can put it up there on the wall so that you guys can see that. Let me go through some of the, the quick uh, news of the day before I get into what I kind of really want to talk about. But there was the, the latest with Shohei Otani, and he came out and, and spoke about um, his translator basically saying he stole the money from him and that he had no idea and that he's never bet and he's never done any of these things and it is completely playing the card of, yo, I, you know, I had nothing to do with this. I had nothing to do with this. Now, I don't know how Guy had access to his bank account. Maybe that's a trust thing. But I will say the one benefit of the doubt I'll give Shohei, if I had that much money, I wouldn't be checking my bank statement. That's the point of having that much money. So you don't have to check your bank statement all the time. You know, to have no worries. Look, if he lied, we'll we'll probably find that out. Um, you know, the translator could 
easily call him out if that's the case, unless he's the fall guy and is getting paid handsomely to be the fall guy. Or Shohei is telling the truth. I mean, there, there's also this NBA betting scandal from today. I don't know if you guys saw this, but a player from the Toronto Raptors, I'm assuming nearly no one has heard of, <laughs> Jonte Porter, apparently the brother of Michael Porter Jr. He's the subject of an NBA investigation because of irregularities when it comes to prop bets. And if you look at the, the story that Adrian Wojnarowski posted, you'll see that there was some strange activity from him on props that they're looking into. And basically, the accusations boil down to, more or less, did he fake, like, injuries or issues so he could check out a game so that the unders would hit on his props? I mean, I didn't even know you could get props on him, <laughs> considering his current player status. Like, who the hell is betting on props on him? But basically, the NBA is seeing or saw increased interest on certain props for him. And one of those nights, he played just four minutes before leaving the game due to what the Raptors said was a re-aggravation of an eye injury he'd suffered four days earlier. He didn't score in that game. Three rebounds, one assist. Didn't attempt a three. Hit the under on all of his props. Apparently, with DraftKings, they reported that the under on his three-pointers was the biggest money winner for betters of any NBA player props from that evening. And then that's a January 26th game. And there's another game on March 20th against the Suns where he played just three minutes before leaving due to what the Raptors said was an illness and did not return, did not score, attempted and missed one shots, and had two rebounds. The next day, DraftKings Sportsbooks reported to its users that Porter's prop bets were the number one moneymaker from the night in the NBA. And there are going to be a lot of people using this as what amounts to a victory lap on sports betting and sports betting scandals and everything that, that goes along with that. You're going to, you're going to get a lot of that people saying, this is, you know, this is what you had coming. This is, we all knew this was coming. And to a degree we did. And, and also I would say when you, when you look at a situation like this, you, does it logically make sense? Like it logically makes sense that, he would only do this twice to keep the trail clear and people would go in big on those nights. Now, is this because sports gambling is legal? I mean, you can make the case this could have happened at any time, right? People gambled on sports before sports gambling was legal. Yes, it's all in our face now. But does that mean, just because it's all in our face now, does that mean... Um, that people are going to cheat more or try to throw it more. I mean, it, it would give you more access. It's easier access for sure. Uh, but it, it, you could also make the case it makes it easier to regulate and catch stuff like this because you have sports books looking at it. You have, you know, oversight of it. And I'm expecting the NBA to come down hard. I mean, the thing is nobody actually cares about him. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure as many people care about the Shohei situation as everybody makes it out. You know, the Shohei situation, if it wasn't in California, what would be the, what would be the, you know, the fallout? You know, sports gambling is not legal in California. So that was part of it. But I'm interested to see how much the fans actually care about this. Because the fans like to sports gamble too and like the sports bet too. And it's mostly media types who are going, this is the reckoning that we knew was coming. You know? The fans actually care. That's an interesting thing to see. That's an interesting thing to see. Get your comments in, guys. Let me know. Like, subscribe, comment, share, all that good stuff. Um... The thing I did want to talk about today, and if you see my social media, you know I've been talking about it a lot, is Kendrick versus Drake. I mean, I'm a rap head. 
I'm a hip hop head. So this sort of stuff excites me. And this is one of those moments, right? This is one of those moments in time that, you know, these things don't happen that often. You don't get these sort of beefs that often. And Kendrick went right at their heads. Specifically, Drake. He went right at him. Out of nowhere. On a banger. On a banger. Which is probably the funniest part about it. Drake's going to hear this this everywhere he goes. I mean, like that might be the song of the summer. And he's eviscerating Drizzy on it. Perhaps the song of the summer. Who gets torn up on the song of the summer? That's what's happening to Drake. Meanwhile, he's at concerts wearing whatever he's wearing. I mean, he's got to he's got to respond hard. J. Cole, J. Cole could get away with a couple of lines because J. Cole really caught strays. Kendrick didn't go at J. Cole hard. Kendrick was like, "What are you doing on first person shooter next to this guy?" And we're not equals. I'm better than you. That that was essentially what Kendrick told J. Cole. You know. Big three, it's just big me. You know, it, for those of you who don't know, over the last decade or so, Kendrick Lamar, Drake, and J. Cole have come to be known as the big three of rap. And they have been the three biggest rappers of their era. And on first person shooter, J. Cole says, you know, is it is it uh, Kendrick, is it Aubrey or me? Essentially calling back to the, the old Jay-Z line, who's the best MCs, Biggie, Jay-Z or Nas? And Jay-Z forced himself into that conversation maybe back at that time. Turned out to be the greatest of all time. But the, the, um, that lyric has lasted a long time. And Kendrick said, screw the big three, it's just big me. If you're Drake, why respond? Uh, He's already in the GOATS discussion. He has more to lose than win because you look like an absolute embarrassment if you don't respond in your Drake. You look like a punk. And, you know, Kendrick is in the GOAT debate just as much as Drake is in the GOAT debate. He is. You know, Drake, Drake's GOAT case is that he's been popular for a long time. I don't know. You know, it's hard. You, You almost have to draw a distinction with him in certain instances because... You don't think of him just as a rapper on one hand because, he, he, you know, he's made some song, sing songy songs, plenty of them, R&B songs. In fact, I would argue the best Drake song is Hold On, We're Going Home. To me, that's the most timeless Drake song. But his GOAT debate status is that he's been popular for a long time. But he already had a ghostwriter scandal, and he already got annihilated by Pusha T. I mean, those are things that are on Drake's ledger. Those don't help you. In any goat debate, and let's not act like Kendrick is some lightweight. That's I, I see Drake fans doing that. Kendrick is a massively commercially successful artist. First of all, you know, aside from Drake, Kendrick is the most commercially successful artist of this generation from the rap standpoint and hip hop standpoint. Number one, Kendrick Lamar, n- next to Drake. Top two, and he is two, at least commercially. But from an adoration and and adulation standpoint, Kendrick surpasses Drake in many ways. He gets more love from, like, the Academy. He's the only rapper, I believe, with a Pulitzer Prize. And I, I did a little short on this, but when you look at their catalog, it's why that line, your best work is a light pack, Prince Outlive Mike Jack, is so impactful. It's why that line cuts so deep. Because what Kendrick is saying there, obviously back in the 80s, there was a Prince Michael Jackson thing going on. And whether or not you agree with the literal premise that Prince is better than Michael Jackson, you don't have to to understand the point. I prefer Prince to Michael Jackson. Like, I don't play Michael Jackson songs on my own. They're the kind of things I hear at a wedding, but they're not like the kind of things I'm rocking. Uh, and and I will play Prince, you know, um, Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy, When Doves Cry, Little Red Corvette, Raspberry Beret. I just, do uh, you want to be my lover? I mean, on and on and on. 
And Prince was known as an artist who made all of his music. You know, Michael Jackson is Quincy Jones, too. He was the king of pop. And I don't think he had the versatility or the bag that Prince has. But nevertheless, they were compared to one another. And the bar, Prince outlived Mike Jack. First of all, it's literally true. Prince lived longer than Michael Jackson. But Kendrick is saying real art is going to last longer than disposable art. And Drake had recently tied Michael Jackson or something with one of these um, one of these last, uh, I think it was first person shooter actually, tied Michael Jackson for some sort of chart topping record. And what Kendrick is saying is that doesn't matter. You know, the stuff I do matters. And if you go and, and look at their, their albums, I mean, say what you want about Kendrick Lamar, but everything he does is interesting. Everything he does is interesting. Good Kid, Mad City, most people would say is a classic. It's like a narrative. To Pimp a Butterfly is not my favorite, but it's hella ambitious. And is a swing for the fences. Damn. Sort of blends like commercial with the Kendrick storytelling and perspectives that you love. Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers was a daring thing too. Even the Black Panther soundtrack. Every, you know, people, I've seen Drake fans come back. Well, Kendrick takes all this time between releases. Well, no shit. Because there's care put into them. You know, each one sounds different. There's no two Kendrick projects that sound alike. I like some of them more than I like other ones, but they're all interesting. Meanwhile, Drake's last several albums could all be called the same thing. Is there a difference? You know, there, is there any difference between CLB and For All the Dogs, except for the names of the songs? No difference. Or, or what was the one? Like, since Views, really. And I would even go back, like he said, your best work is a light pack. My favorite Drake album is probably Nothing Was the Same. I can see the argument for Take Care. But is either Nothing Was the Same or Take Care better than Damn? Or Good Kid Mad City? Nope. Nope. And J. Cole don't have an album as good as Kendrick's either. J. Cole don't have an album that can touch Kendrick's. Yes, it is just my opinion. This is my show. <laughs> That's what I do is I give you my opinion. <laughs> and again, five years. That's the point. Drake could have stood to take a break and make a different sound. Not the same damn thing every time. <laughs> And I would disagree. Drake's catalog as a whole is not better. I would say Kendrick's catalog as a whole is significantly better than Drake's. Significantly better. More memorable. More ambitious. I'm assuming you're talking about Kendrick here, Ernesto. And aside from that, you know, it's a competitive sport. Rap is always... Drake's throwing little shots... At Kendrick for a minute now. He's throwing little shots at Kendrick for a minute now. And Kendrick came right out and said, let's go, homie. I mean, your best work is a light pack. Prince outlived Mike Jack. For all the dogs getting buried, that's a K with all these nines. You're going to see the pet cemetery? Bum? <laughs> And, and, like, that's not a record that's here today, gone tomorrow. Like, as ill as the story of OJ is, and as much as Drake gets clown for the story of OJ, I'm not story of OJ, the story of Adna, obviously Pusha used the story of OJ beat. Um, as much as Drake gets clown for that, you weren't just hearing that wherever you went, right? Like, people weren't just playing. This is like a strip club joint. Uh, uh, bumping out a car joint, uh, shake your thing in the club joint. 
a headphone joint, a cruise around joint, and in the gym joint. I mean, I was doing push-ups and sit-ups to it last night. R- running it back over and over. Oh! <laughs> like, this is an iconic moment in hip-hop history. Drake got his head taken off on a song that's going to be played all summer. With bars. These were not light shots. These were not taps. These were direct punches to the face. Of Drake specifically. Again, Cole caught strays. Cole can Cole can go, all right. You know, I, I think Cole, just out of pride, I would imagine Cole claps back with a line or two. You know, I, I do think we'll see that. But Drake needs to come full full throttle. You know, he needs to come back all the way. The song is that good. It is. It's a great song. It's great. The verse is amazing. It's great. There's nothing bad about the song. Beat knocks. Hook is great. And Kendrick eviscerates these dudes on a verse that's quotable, on a verse that you can rock. I could do a TikTok to that joint. It is that good. You're going to have to deal with that. I'm not a fan. I'm not that big a fan of Drake. You know, I, I, I'm a fan in the sense of he's an icon in the culture and he's made some music I like. Um, and And to keep up abreast with things. You know, I I listen to everything he puts out. I do. I, I don't have any animosity toward him. No personal animosity. I just don't. I don't think he's all that. You know, his debut album was okay. I mean, Light Up is the most memorable thing from his debut album. That's a Jay-Z verse. Uh, his debut official studio, I, I realized So Far Gone was the project that kind of made him, right? Um, you know, Take Care is like a weekend record. I like Nothing Was the Same. I like it. I don't say I like run it back all the time. Views I don't like. Everything since then has sounded exactly the same other than maybe the More Life Project, which I kind of dug. And what was the one, honestly, never mind, that never should have saw the light of day? Um... But, yeah. And so, I think there are people who kind of feel like I feel, who to see Kendrick go at him so hard, it's like, oh, okay. Because he's calling him out for the things that a lot of people feel. You know, a lot of people feel, I saw somebody in the comments of the Instagram video I do say, Drake is definitely a McDonald's hamburger. And Kendrick is a filet mignon. What do you think? Of the entire future album. Uh, it's good. You know, the production is good. I'm not a big future guy. You know, in fact, future pisses me off at the beginning of like that because all oh, that misogynistic shit I can't rock with anymore. I'm a 42 year old man with children and a daughter. You know, I don't want to hear you talk about what you're going to do to women at your age. Um, and, you know, Future has some vibes, and he's got a distinct sound. I, I I like the sound of his voice. And, you know, stuff like Mask Off will bang from here to eternity. And the album itself is good in that sense. Like, it has good production. It sounds good. But, I, you know, like, I, um, I don't love Future because of stuff like that. And, in fact, like, I play the whole song. But once I get to Kendrick's part and listen to it, I go back to that part and play that over and over and over and over again. See, this is not, this shouldn't be the case. Drake is my age. Why the hell would I have aged out of Drake's music? That makes no sense. Isn't it the other way around? He's too old to be making the shit he makes? I mean, that last, for all the dogs, was kind of disturbing. Some of the lyrics on that record for a guy of Drake's 
you know, stature and caliber. It was gross. I don't want to hear you talking about women that way, man. It, you know, it's creepy. You're an, you're a, a grown ass man. You're not a teenager. So you can't tell me I grew out of his music. I, we're the same fucking age. <laughs> Ernest says Drake is going to do a ballad. I mean, the biggest rapper in the game is McDonald's. You know, no, that's no. I I don't think that sounds ridiculous at all. I think Drake gains the streaming system and gains a lot of streams that way and knows his formula is going to work and just repeats his formula over and over again. And there's nothing interesting about it. Meanwhile, if you're telling me Kendrick Lamar is releasing a project, I'm anticipating it. And I don't have Kendrick as the goat or whatnot, but Kendrick makes music that is exciting. I know there's going to be a challenge there. I know it's going to sound different. I don't know what to expect when it comes out. I would just like once to not know what to expect when I hit play on a Drake record. And he's a better rapper than Drake. I mean, he just proved it. He just told him that. He just said, bring it on. Let's get it. Bring it on. You know, that that's the um the long and short of it. Kendrick is that's hip hop. He's saying I'm better than you. Let's do it. I'm not playing no games. And now you got Drake fans going like, but but Drake doesn't have to respond. <laughs> what? Isn't this rap music? What do you mean Drake doesn't have to respond? I mean, Drake looks like a complete and total lame if he doesn't respond. Kendrick ate him alive on a banger that's going to play all summer. I mean, people used to say that about back-to-back. Oh, Meek got clowned on a banger. Meek, let's be real about it. Meek has made some good songs, but he ain't playing in the same level. He ain't on the same tier. If we're doing one of those tier lists, Meek ain't on the same tier. As Kendrick, Cole, and Drake. This is a different combatant. And Kendrick just ate Drake up on a track that is going to get run. If you don't think that track's getting run, you're delusional. That track is going to be everywhere. It's already tracking to be the number one song in the country. Meek was light work. Push It was more of a... I've never... No one's ever thought... Oh, let's put Meek on a track and see if he eats up one of the other greats. Or how, you know, I, I saw Pusher earlier talking about his features with Jay-Z and how he, he thought he got the best of them in, uh, on Drug Dealers Anonymous, which I think is just wrong, by the way. I think Pusher is 0 for 3 against Hove. I, th- I think he's 0 for 3. But um, – He said he thinks he won on Drug Dealers Anonymous and lost on So Appalled and Neck and Wrist. I would say he lost on all three, but he held his own. And he certainly didn't lose against Drake. Dude, it's the number one song. It's going to be the number one song in the country. What do you mean it's not getting run? That's the... I know, obviously, you're a Drake fan. You would make the case for Drake that Drake has all these hits. And then you're going to make the case against this being a hit? Because it's a hit. Undeniable. It's undeniable. Y'all are in de- you're, y'all are in denial if you're denying it. Is what I would say. Banger ass song, killer ass verse from Kendrick Lamar. That's gonna stand the test of time. And I think that your best work is a light pack. Prince out live. Your best work is a light pack. Prince out live. Mike Jack is gonna be one of the most iconic lines in hip hop history. One of the most iconic lines in hip-hop history. People will be talking about that forever. We'll see how Drake responds. Look, if, if if he brings heat, he brings heat. I mean, Drake is talented. You know? Or the people writing for him are. No, I mean, look, Drake has made some good songs. Drake has been in battles before. He just needs to step up to the plate. 
He needs to step up to the plate. Because what Kendrick did was just generational. Now I'm just trolling some of y'all. <laughs> you get so upset about this. But I do believe that. I do believe. You know, this is not a normal record. This is not one of those songs that's here today, gone tomorrow. This is one of those songs we'll be talking about for the rest of our lives. And Kendra came so hard on this joint. It came so hard on this joint. <laughs> you guys are, some of you guys are in shambles. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll play it. As soon as I'm done here, I'm going to play it. I'm going to go back and play it again. And run through it again. Because I love that joint. That That thing slaps. And Kendrick's verse is just, I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. All right, last thing I had on the rundown since Raw is coming up. I, I don't know if you guys saw this clip from Rhea Ripley at a house show with Nia Jax, but it was everywhere. And it's pretty funny because um, Rhea Ripley is doing something that Rikishi once did in the past, right? Like, it's not as if... This is, um, you know, a new thing. It just happens to be a woman doing it now. And then that, that leads to all the, the claims of what you want to call it. Um, all the claims of uh, sexual exploitation or, or what have you. Let me, let me, for anyone who hasn't seen it, let me pull up the initial clip real quick. Here's Rhea Ripley. From I think this was from a house show, right? <laughs> that used to be called the the stank face when the teeth did it back in the day, and then I think the next day she tried to do it to Shayna Baszler, and Shayna Baszler like invited it, as uh, the internet was saying, but. Look, does Rhea Ripley capitalize on her sexuality and, and looks? Sure. Uh, does WWE, I've seen some camera shots that would say they might. But she's a star because of her charisma, because of the fact that she can look good, but also look strong, right? Like she, she looks good, but she looks like she could kick your ass too, which is hard to pull off at the same time. And she's got this character and, and has really leaned into it and, and clearly is out there having fun. But we literally saw Rikishi do that all the time. This is not a new thing. It's just a girl doing it now. So it does show you there is a little bit of a double standard sometimes, right? You know, R Rikishi used to come out and, and do that, whatever you want to call it, the stank face all the time. Just was a huge Samoan dude doing it instead of Rhea Ripley. And that was hilarious, <laughs> right? That was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but, but instead now it's, it's oh, this is, this is, uh, exploitation or, or or she's you know using her sex to sell to a certain extent but she was really just paying tribute to rikishi i don't know if how many of you guys remember rikishi i'm trying to find a video of him doing the the stank face itself but you know rikishi was a big big dude and he would do the dance and stuff with a uh, scotty too hottie right <laughs> here here's a here's a gif of Rikishi I found just so you for anybody who doesn't know what he looks like this is what Rikishi looks like right here that guy <laughs> who just sent the other guy out of the ring with a butt thrust I suppose you would call that all right that's what I had on the rundown for tonight guys hit me up with any other comments anything you want answered um you're, that was fun, Robin. Until next time. Hey, I appreciate the back and forth. I, I'm having fun at your expense a little bit. We're we're talking shit, but all good, man. Um, that's part of the, the that's part of what's fun about it. Appreciate you joining and and being a part of the the chat. Um, I, I do uh, appreciate that honestly. Um, too cool was fun to watch. Says Bill L. <laughs> did you know Yokozuna wasn't Japanese? Blew my mind. Yes, I did know that. Um, well, I mean, I did a piece on the the origins of the bloodline recently i don't know when i learned it i think i learned it through one of those yokozuna documentaries like one of these a a pieces that wwe has and puts out um so i think that's where i learned it it's not like i um 
knew that my whole life or anything. But for those of you who don't know, you know, Yokozuna is part of the same bloodline that Roman Reigns and The Rock are. Now, The Rock and Roman Reigns are not related by blood, but their grandfathers had a blood oath, uh, Peter Maivia. And then Roman's grandfather is the father of the Wild Samoans, who then that leads to, you know, a, a branch out of Rikishi and the Usos and Yokozuna and Umaga and others. And it's really, you know, one of the greatest dynasties in the history of wrestling, if not the greatest dynasty in the history of wrestling. What do I expect from Punk tonight on Raw? Raw's coming up in a few minutes. I'll, I'll get out of here before that starts tonight. But, um, you know, Punk is great on the mic. I would expect him to do that. Maybe give a hint on when he'll be back. Maybe lay, plant some seeds for what he'll be doing when he gets back. I, I think, obviously, that feud with Drew McIntyre is sitting there waiting for him. Um, maybe for the World Heavyweight title. And then, you know what I really want to see in the future is Punk Roman. After that, that clip from Roman on uh what was it on uh McAfee where he said you know I don't get to the top and it's not exactly how I thought it was going to look and act like a bitch about it like CM Punk like it was like Ooh. and when Punk mentioned Roman's name or referenced him in one of his first promos when he came back you could notice the crowd really reacted to that so I think a Roman Punk program at some point could be really really good down the line and in the future for sure uh i i did address this bill if you want to check out earlier in the show but long story short i mean i'm gonna have to wait till the real investigation comes out i actually find it believable that he didn't know things would go missing from his bank account he's got so much money um the question is how did dude have access to his bank account but maybe he did trust him um implicitly so either a you know shohei's telling the truth B, Shohei's lying and the translator's going to come out and say something. Or C, Shohei's lying and the translator's the fall guy here. I think any of those are possibilities, but I don't think it's as uh, far-fetched as everybody's making it seem. He could have given this guy access to his bank account because he trusted him to to make marketing decisions, to do whatever, um, and then just not seeing the money gone because he's so rich. Why is he checking his bank account all the time? I mean, you hear $4.5 million, it sounds like a lot. It's not that much money to him. That's the truth of it. But, you know, they got the they got the paper trail, so they're going to find out. We'll know before too long what the actual truth is. Now, all of a sudden, a female does the same move that Rikishi used to do, and it's illegal. Come on, people. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of a double standard there, for sure. Women have faced that for a minute. I mean, I do think, you know, <laughs> women's wrestling in particular – has come a long, long way. Oh, and uh, last thing I did reference this at the top of the show, but Diddy's in trouble. Once the feds come knocking, I mean, I, I assume Donald Trump was in trouble. Maybe not. You know, it, it, we'll see what, what happens with that. But generally, once the feds do a sweep or whoever it was that's equivalent to the feds, you're in trouble. And, and I don't know enough about, I mean, I've read up on the Diddy situation and I've seen like the videos and the like, but it's not something I'm going to delve into without the the authority to speak on it but things look bleak for him and it certainly looks like um he's been involved in some grimy shit for a long time let's put it that way he's in he's in big big trouble and we've seen the end of the puffy p diddy empire if you will all right last chance to get some comments in before i get out of here for tonight um like, subscribe, comment on the channel. Make sure you, you do so if you, you join after the fact um, because I uh, will get back to you. If you notice, I get back to a lot of people there. I, I thought it was worth me explaining the Conor McGregor situation just because it was everywhere and I'm the only one who was present for it. Um, <laughs> you know, so or, or there was a couple, I'm sure there was people on the studio side and and people in our control room, for the most part. Uh, I was the only person actively present in there other than Jake Gyllenhaal, which is, by the way, a pretty surreal thing when you think about it. Like, oh, yeah, you talked to Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor, and it went viral because of this, whatever was going on with him. Um, but I did not plan for that to go viral. I did not see that until it went out. And I did not 
I was almost in uncomfortable even doing this show today. Like I didn't want to, I don't want to clout chase around something that could be serious. And that I really didn't do anything to bring out. Like it wasn't like, wow, great work, Robin. It was like, there's this guy who, by the way, it's all attributed to sports illustrated that, you know, uh, sports illustrated is an awesome brand. I hope everything works out for everybody in, involved, including myself. But, you know, it was one of the reasons I said I, I started a channel like this and my own stuff is because so much of this work I had done for SI was credited just to SI and not to me. Um, so I want to make sure I got my own thing going as well. So even if everything works out perfectly, um, I will continue to do this. It will evolve a little bit. Like I said, maybe the times shift, maybe the number of lives I dial back and do some more produce videos. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Um, as of now, I'm, I'm keeping the same consistent schedule or close to it. Um, but you know, that's, that's the deal. Like subscribe, comment, all that Kendrick ate Drake alive. I'm sorry. Can't apologize for that. He's really like that. Robin Lundberg show. See you next time. Same Robin channel.